Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 219 of Two Legs. We are mainly a Paul McCartney podcast centering on the solo career of the one and only Paul McCartney. And I am one of your two co-hosts, Andy Nichols. And joining me today, as always, the reason that I'm here is Mr. Tom Hunyadi. Hello, Tom. Andy, good to see you, my friend. It's This is going to be another fascinating show, and I cannot wait to, to talk to our special guest here who um you know the special yeah. book right here um, big one we're gonna talk it's, yes yeah. we're, gonna, we're gonna talk about this book yeah there you go he's got another copy right there we're gonna talk about this we're gonna talk about some 80s paul mm -hmm. and uh, this is gonna be a fun episode yeah so as you can see below joining us today is uh, the legendary and iconic journalist mr peter doggett who is I've, it's the first time i've been called iconic since lunch <laughs> Well, sir, I mean, Peter is, uh, you know, if, if no stranger in, in the world of uh, Beatles literature. He has written a hundred, you know, so many articles and has tons of books, not just on the Beatles. He's written a ton of stuff out there. I believe he did a book on, um, was it Prince, too? Or not, uh, um, not Prince, no, David Bowie. David Bowie was a recent oh, book, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young. That's right. And a book, and, I believe, uh, on sex in the 60s, too. Yeah. Look at this. I'm fully prepared. Yeah. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, this is only available in uh, Britain and in Australia for some reason. Okay. That's just... But it has got some Beatles things in there, so... Obviously. But uh, we, we are honored to have you on here, and thanks for coming on yes, to thank uh, you. have a chat with us today about a book that really raised the bar in terms of... Um, information and readability really uh, on a topic that um, was not easily you know to read about you hear about all these different lawsuits over the years revolving the post breakup years but in this volume Peter has summed up all the activity that happened for the all four solo Beatles um, as you know as artists with their career but then also all the litigation that went on during that period as well um, but before we get into the book proper Peter, tell us about your background um, as, as a journalist and an author, and how did you get your start? Um, well, before I was a journalist and an author, I was a music fan, and I was mm -hmm. very specifically a Beatles fan. Um, I'm old enough to remember the Beatles' first time round, but uh, mm. 63, 64, like every other kid in England, I was, I was doing the twists, you know, at school parties <laughs> when I was age six or whatever. Um, and then I got interested in sport instead. And so after 64, I basically, I just left music. I wasn't interested. Um, as kids are, you know, prone to do, just follow a new obsession. And then 1970, almost by chance, I got back into music. My older cousin took me to see a double bill of the movies Yellow Submarine and Let It Be. Um, and I said, well, this is great, you know. And then I discovered, to my horror, they'd broken up um, about two months beforehand. Um, and it's amazing in retrospect to think that, I mean, when I broke up, sorry, when they broke up, I was 12, I guess, and my parents were buying a newspaper every day, and I read it, and I don't remember the Beatles breaking up at all. It wasn't that big a story, so mm, there wow. you go. Whereas these days, it would be front cover for months to come. Um, and I, what really changed my life was seeing A Hard Day's Night. Um, on the BBC, um, I can remember everything about it. Four o'clock in the afternoon. It was the 20th, it's so sad I remember this, 28th of December, 1970. Um, I'm not I'm not the only person who watched it because John Lennon. John also Lennon watched. also watched it yeah, too. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I probably enjoyed it more than he did, I should think. But um, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I madly fell in love with the Beatles and I got Beatlemania six years too mm. late and it was a time as we all know when all four Beatles were beginning their solo careers and so right. there was lots of stuff happening they were in the English music papers every week rumors about getting back together or suing each other or whatever but at the same time I had the whole mystery of um, uncovering the past of the Beatles and unlike these days when you can go online and discover everything you need to know. Right. Back in 1970, you know, I used to wander into my local record shop and there would be these sealed albums. I was particularly intrigued by the white covered one because it was sealed and you had no idea what was on it. And so you could just imagine, um, well, there's a title, um, imagine what was, <laughs> what was going to be on it. And it was you know, two or three years before 
I actually got to hear that and Sergeant Pepper. You relied on mm. friends at school who had older brothers right. who were prepared right. to lend you the record, you know. Innocent times. But, um, so from that point, I, I was a Beatles maniac. I, I was shattered in 1980 when John died. And just mm. before John died, I was extraordinarily lucky. I, I um, talked my way into a job at the magazine Record Collector, mm. which had only just started in England. I think I was probably the only person who applied for the job who actually knew what the magazine was. Mm. And it was, if you, if you remember the old Beatles monthlies, mm. when I joined, Record Collector was the same size. It was a small little thing. Um, and so for my sins, I not only got to work on Record Collector, a lot of which was about the Beatles, but we, but um, Sean Hermione, who was the publisher, was also republishing the Beatles monthly every month. And we had to write eight pages, or it became 16, I think, of new stuff to go around the outside of the reprints. And so as, a Be as the resident Beatles fan, I ended up doing a lot of that. Um, so, yeah, so it was pretty obvious then for me to, I mean, I had to keep up with what the Beatles were doing. Right. Um, well, you came into the, the universe of the Beatles at a really weird time because they were breaking up and the solo career started. Yeah. So you had to kind of dive into the six years passed to get and then kind of stay hip with what was coming out at the time so you're buying you were buying all these records in real time in the early 70s as they were solo sure, artists correct yeah. and and also you had to pick time had to pick sides you it was really <laughs> difficult as a 13 14 year old in 70 71 you're mm -hmm. finding your way immediately into a battle mm. um uh, which actually right. is a word, it's a word we'll come back to a bit later on in this interview, I think. Mm. But you either had to pick hip John Yoko George side, or you had to put uh, pick square old boring sourpuss Paul McCartney side because that's how it was presented in the enemy right. and the melody maker at the time. Yes, it was. And as a, it's as a shame a, too. Oh, it's it's ridiculous in retrospect, yeah. of course, yeah. Yeah. But there was no doubt which side I was on in 1970, 71. I was on the cool, hip, rebellious, power to the people side. Yeah. Now, that didn't that didn't stop me buying another day or ram because okay. it was still still a beetle. But um, it took me several years to be sort of to be able to stand back enough and say okay, maybe all the sort of propaganda we've been getting from, from John particularly and from Alan right. Klein, maybe there was another side to it. And, um, and, you got to, and you got to see like the war of words there too in, in real time as well. You got to see, you know, John yeah, making yeah. his smart-ass comments about Paul yeah. and then Paul responding, you know. So Yeah, and so that uh, as been... a, Go ahead. It, it, yeah, it was fantastic. And as a teenage smart-ass myself, <laughs> Obviously, I was I was impressed by by John because he was like he was in a hard day's night. He was quick witted right. and quick witted. And, yeah, exactly. Now Paul can be, but he tends to be much drier and sometimes he takes the high well. road as well. Yeah. You know, oh yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So so you you joined um, Record Collector in 1980, and and how long did you stay there? For about 300 years, I think it was. It certainly <laughs> felt like it. Look, my hair fell out. <laughs> um, it was 19 years and then a couple of years sort of wow. hanging about uh, the office sort of going, because I lived just down the road anyway, so I would sort of mm. pop in and do things. Um, yeah, 19 years, yeah. Seems longer, but... Uh, yeah, mm. and, and uh, you know, your body of work is just, you know, exquisite. But, I mean, let's get into the topic of the book, and if you don't know the title of the book, the name of the book is You Never Give Me Your Money, and this is the U.S. edition. Peter's got the um, U.K. edition there. No, this is the U.S. paperback. I'm, oh, I'm, starting the US feel, paperback. Oh. I'm starting to feel like Ringo, and I just asked me about the new album. <laughs> Peace mm. and love. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no autographs. No autographs. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, let me tell you about this book. I mean, I had an idea. Yeah, yeah please. Um, probably way back when I was still at Record Collector, so we're in the 90s, I was aware there was not a good book about... The, the story of the breakup and what happened afterwards and specifically what happened, the relationship between the four of them, um, the fighting, the rapprochement, the court cases, the collaborations, the rumours, all this sort of stuff. 
And I did not want to write that book for years mm. after. Um, I was so beetled out after writing about them sort of almost every day, it seemed like for 20 years. It was like, no, that's the last thing I want to do. Um, and it, I had, was having a conversation with my book agent in, I don't know, 2006 or something, and I raised it as an idea. And he said, oh, no, that sounds a terrible idea. So I thought, well, F you, in that case, I'm going <laughs> to do it. Sorry, Rupert, he died last year. I'm really sorry. Um, right. Um, or this year. Um, so I decided to do it. And the work, I, I always knew the book had to be called You Never Give Me Your Money. Right, perfect um, title. And the subtitle, this is the, where the battle comes back. The subtitle of the book in England, the original edition, is the battle for the soul of the Beatles. Right. Mm. Right. Now, mm. when it came out in America, um, I'm not going to mention any names, but for a start, they wanted to chop the book in half, almost in half, because they said it was too long. So I had to fi had fight, fight that battle. Mm. Then they wanted to retitle it. It's just American publishers. They don't like to do what... Um, blowing my whole career here but it's true if as a if as a british author they like to change you know put as much of their own input in as possible mm. um, and they wanted to change the title from you never give me your money to and in the end mm. and i said well have you read the book because the whole point is it mm. wasn't the end you know um mm -hmm. they carried on there, there was the relationship going on to this day and then the third fight which i lost was we want to call it the Beatles after the breakup. And I said, well, it's not because it's, um, it's, it's very specifically a book about the relationship between the four of them and also the entity that was the Beatles. It's not about their solo careers. But because of this title on the American edition, um, I mean, I, I, I never Google myself. I don't read anything that anybody says online. But a number of times I've come across by accident um, American readers saying, oh, what a sellout. He doesn't even mention, you know, Pipes of Peace or, I don't know, Ringo's Route of Review or whatever. How can it be the Beatles after the breakup? Well, that's not what the book was supposed to be about. Right. It was supposed to be about. Right. It, it was about the myth and the reality yeah. of being in the Beatles, right. breaking up, and then trying to cope with that reality afterwards. Yeah, you weren't writing a sessionography about the individual no. solo albums. You, you right. touch upon them as no. they as they are as they are merited, but it, it, this is about the the relationships of the four of them. Yeah, and, and, and right. if, in fact, I only mention them when they're relevant to the story. To the, of the story, relationships. Yeah. correct? So, yes. so obviously, yeah. I'm going to mention Imagine because it's got mm. How Do You Sleep on it, and I'm going to mention right. Wildlife because it's got Dear Friends. Mm. Dear Friend, and, right? And yeah, obviously, so, the solo albums up until seventy four five, when Apple's dissolved, is is very integral to the story because yeah. the money was all pooled still together then. Exactly. Right. So yeah. I could see up to that point having to discuss all those solo albums up until that point being very part of the story. But after that, there's you know, there's somewhere in England. Okay, all those years ago, fine. You're not going to really. We don't need a chapter on old wave in this book. You know. No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Ringo. <laughs> yeah, but but the 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 idea of of the lawsuit and now as you following the the story in 1970, you were getting a sense you were you were you were learning about all of these lawsuits as they as they came. So so starting the research for the book was that a difficult uh, process, or were you able to jump right in or talk about the procedure? Yeah, the research it, methods. I mean, obviously it took a while, but it didn't take as long as it would have done if I hadn't been a fan. I mean, that helped. Right. Um, and as a sort of anally retentive fan, as a 13 year old, any any um, article from the English music press or the national press I came across about the Beatles, I faithfully cut out, didn't put them in a scrapbook, but they just were in a pile in my bedroom and somehow they didn't get thrown away. And so when I came to write the book, I had two boxes of these things, these kind of things. And also through being at Record Collector, I just accumulated stuff. People would say, oh, I came across this. Would you like a copy of it? Sure, okay. Um, and often that when I came to write the book, I found I had things that I didn't know how I got them. Um, and I couldn't remember. I mean, just because I was, you know, I was really busy. It was a full-time job right, running record right. collector. And 
stuff just came at you non-stop you know um so there was no time to stop and take anything in it was just like oh put that aside come back to it and um so i was very very lucky uh, with the amount of stuff i kept obviously as a fan i knew an awful lot um mm. and then when i was doing the research for the book things um just sort of tumbled into my lap and i often can't explain where they came from but i happen <laughs> to be in the right place at the right time on many occasions to see things that i i know i shouldn't have seen mm. Uh, and maybe what is it Ellen LeBron says all the way through help I can say no more I can say no, no more, more. Yes. Yeah. Say no more. So, yeah yeah but yeah so I, I saw stuff that um I shouldn't I shouldn't have seen and obviously that that sort of colored uh, the book right gave me a lot right. of extra background information uh, which I don't the, think any level of right has, the level of detail that the level of detail Sorry. that you also put into the book, I apologize for interrupting, um, is, is phenomenal. I mean, it really raised the bar for, for I think, Beatle books. I mean, a lot of times you just get, you know, it just, you know, scrape over things or whatever. But you really put the, the attention to detail in the book. The research uh, is, is, is obvious um, for that. I mean, did you set an expectation for yourself for this book? I mean, it's just like, I have to have this part in it. I have to understand why this happened, you know, as you're going, as you're writing, you know, all these pieces are coming together. I mean, talk about, you know, your, or were you finding yourself excited for what you were learning or were you like, oh my God, I can't believe this happened or, you know, just, um, just talk about all, what, you, yeah. you know, the experience while you were writing it. All of the above and more. Yeah. In fact, one of my strongest feelings writing it, particularly around the time of the breakup, writing about Paul, reacting to things mm. um i was it around then yes it was it was around the same time i was training as a as a, as a counselor humanistic counselor and so that was actually really useful when it came to write this book because i was studying sort of family relations and the way people interact and the way um in a particular relationship one person will be the parent and the other person will be the child even if they're just friends or if they're married to each other. So there were so many times when I was writing the book when I wanted to grab all of the Beatles, but usually Paul, because he's the one I felt most sorry for, um, mm. and say, no, don't. I know he, they're really pissing you off. You know, they're saying these awful mm. things. They're acting like assholes, mm. as you would mm. say in America. But <laughs> don't don't react. Step Step away. Don't say anything. And I guess the prime instance of that is, and I mentioned this in the book, if Paul hadn't done the, um, the sort of fake interview with the McCartney album mm. and that hadn't been publicised, would the Beatles have broken up? And I sort of speculate that, particularly given how mercurial uh, John was, I think George and Ringo would have gone for it. It was. It is quite possible. It's quite possible John would still not have wanted to do anything, but if Paul hadn't come out and said I broke up the Beatles effectively, um, and it hadn't been interpreted that way, then you know it's possible John might have phoned them up and said, "Okay, I've got these songs. They're called God, Working Class Hero, right. Mother. They're on our next album." And if the rest of them would have gone, "Oh, okay," mm. um, you know, it's weird to sort of imagine a Beatles album that might have had. Goodness knows, backseat of my car, <laughs> and also work, working class hero. But it would have been a wonderful record. Right. Well, mother. So yeah. you 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 yeah. think by by Paul doing that 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 mock interview led to you know some maybe some bitterness with the other three not wanting to because we all know the stories of Paul too being hard to work with you know especially during the second half of of the Beatles you know George I mean especially you I mean you can see you see that in the uh, when the, the three of them give their comments uh, to the judge for when Paul sues the other three, yeah. you know, George's comments, well, you know, I, you know, I had to work on 30 of his songs before he would work on one of mine, but he would lovingly yeah. do it, but yeah. I still had to work on 30 of his yeah. before he would even, you know, work on mine. So we knew that already about Paul, but you, you seem to think that because of this, this, this uh, interview, this, this fake interview that he does for McCartney is what kind of like, 
you know sets the scene for them not working together again. Yeah, because it and it, it it doesn't just affect the relationship between the four of them; it affects how they're seen in the world because it's interpreted in a certain way. Uh, Paul, okay. you know, uh, I forget what the newspaper pla- the, you know, the hoarding, the placard was in this country, but it was something like "Paul, the Beatles are over." Melody and maker. The, uh, yeah, and uh, the. Um, one of the, the, the newspapers, Daily Mirror, maybe one oh, of them. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and once that story's out there, it's very hard to row back and say, "Oh, I didn't mm. mean that." Actually, I was just right. promoting my album, and I was in a bad mood right. that day. And, and um, that's what he thought he was doing. He was pro- he thought yeah. he was promoting. I, it's, it, but wrongly, I mean, I don't think that was the way to do it myself. Yeah. You know, you know, hindsight being twenty twenty, he probably realized now. I mean. That he probably shouldn't have gone that in that direction. I yeah, but it's it, it's understandable, and also right. in Paul, Paul's defense, again, what you were just saying about George and so on, which I'm sure is true about the that oh, Paul's got another twelve songs he's written this morning. Well, we have to do <laughs> them. Oh dear, one of them is Maxwell Silver Hammer Part so, Two. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, it's, um, <laughs> But if Paul hadn't been like that, there would have been no Beatles after six after Brian Epstein died. No, there would, they would not. And have possibly been. not even before right. that. Possibly after they gave up touring, there would have been no Beatles, because the rest of them couldn't have been bothered to get off their asses and no. do anything. So. And and that's why if you look at the career of the Beatles, you can see that in the first half, John Lennon is clearly the driving force, and from Revolver onwards, it's McCartney. That's, that's I don't know if you agree with that, but. It's yeah. A, oh, ab- it, absolutely. Yeah. It's a it's a clear dividing line to see that he carried them through the end from '66 to the end to keep yeah. them going because they were just John and George were just did not care anymore and he was no. the only one keeping them going, 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 going. So. But the aftermath of that, or the effect of you know the reverberations of Paul being in charge, being the boss. I mean, you can see it if you look at the film mm-hmm. from '94, whenever it is. Of the, the three Beatles playing yeah. Blue Moon of Kentucky yeah. and thinking of Lincoln. Yeah. <laughs> Just look at George's face. Particularly when Paul he oversings every line and goes woo 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 at the end of every line. Because he's nervous. That's his way of dealing with it, I think. It, it, yeah. right. And George, you can just see George going, What the hell am I doing here? Why am I well, doing this? Well, that, he, he needed it. He, he, he oh, needed yeah. it. Yeah, he they needed to do it. That- yeah, you have to think that if if handmade film, if he didn't have his that issue with his yeah. business partner with handmade films, would he even have done? That he wouldn't have even done it. He needed the money. Yeah, yeah. Um, which, yeah go ahead. Which, which doesn't mean, and we're leaping way ahead. Yeah, um, obviously yeah. that doesn't mean that Paul and George weren't close friends because I'm sure they were. Right, but it's oh, just they were, yeah. it's just that George didn't want to work with Paul. No. Right. No. And and yeah, to be fair just, to George, he did keep saying that right. you know, into interview I'd after rather, interview. Yeah, yeah. I'd uh, rather be in a band yeah. with Willie Weeks than uh, than yeah, Paul McCartney. Yeah. 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 You know? So, one of the things that that is so enjoyable about the book, and I must have read it five, probably five or six times, is is how quick, despite all this information, and money, and lawsuits, it, the book is such an easy read, and it is because you you, you have the you have the you talk about the relationships and how each event then affects the other one. Intertwine. In, how they how, intertwine. How, it's yeah. not just, you know, it, it, that's why it, that's why it is such a, a, a quick and easy read. Despite all this information in here about the money and the percentages, it reads so easily. And and that's why you, 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 you it has a personal touch to it. And that's, I think well, it's, it's a credit to you. That's very kind. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, it's got a personal touch because I cared. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and I wanted to see them as people. That was the other thing. Um, it's about it's about them as a myth, and it's about them as four people, and struggling just to come to terms with what they've done. And you know, if you're the four most famous people in the world, and then you're not together, how do you cope? What do you do? And that's what the mm. book is about. Peter, what decade? Um, was uh, giving some pers- perspective on like because obviously the lawsuits you've got a lot of Klein lawsuits there in, in 72 mm-hmm. 3 when John and George order that clandestine investigation of the affairs obviously in the 80s it spills into a lot more. what decade was um, had more teeth to it uh, as, a, as you say in terms of like the, the lawsuits and trying to get the best bits to present it in the book the 70s or the 80s 
Um, I was going to say 60s. Or 60s, yeah. <laughs> yeah so, so there we are. Um, yeah, it, it, get, it got harder in the 80s um, because mm. there's less material leaking out there. there are, if there are lawsuits, they get settled privately. Mm. And so you don't get the thing. I mean, you can go to a National Archives in London right. and you can, um, if, you, if you ask nicely and you fill in the right forms, you can sit there surrounded by boxes of all the uh, affidavits and things from the original uh, uh, court case, 1971, when Paul was breaking up the partnership. And again, ongoing litigation in the first half of the 70s between with Apple suing Abco and Abco suing Apple. And um, so uh, no, there's so much information there to draw on. And then most of the stuff that I got access to that I shouldn't have done was also from that sort of 68 to 75 mm. era. Period. So after that, it's much more a case of almost tracking them through what they're saying in public. Because another thing I found was fascinating. Um, I always think it was a danger when people are writing a book about anybody, um, but particularly people who have given lots of interviews, as the four Beatles did, is to take one of those interviews and say, that's what they thought. Now, we know with John Lennon, um, he was on heroin or whatever he was on when he did the Rolling Stone interview in 1970. And if he'd been on a different drug the next day, he would have given a different interview. Different interview, yeah. Yeah. Um, so one of the things I really enjoyed doing was going, okay, here's a subject. What did Paul, because he tended to talk about these things more than the others, what did Paul think about the relationship with John? What did he think about the breakup? And it changes um, as he's going through from, you know, every time he's asked, you get a slightly different perspective. Mm. It's like the thing about how close were you to John in the final years before John died? That's a story that keeps changing. It sort of, mm. the goalposts, you know. Well, mm -hmm. not that close to now. It's sort of, oh, we were fully best friends again. Right. And the truth is probably somewhere in the middle there. Somewhere in between, yeah. It's funny. You've got that. Uh, I don't know if it's in, in the book, but I know I know you do talk about it. Um, you've got those uh, famous photographs of Alan Klein with Yoko and John <laughs> yeah. and Neil Aspinall, I want to say like January of 77. And that's when everything, I think, finally was done with Klein. Yeah. Is that is that accurate? Um, I can't remember the date. It's too many years ago since I wrote the book. But yeah, that sounds right, 77, 78. Mm -hmm. And then there's the thing of Paul and Linda saying, oh, brilliant, John and Yoko solved this, but they did it with yeah. five, $5 million of the Beatles' <laughs> money, a quarter of which had to be paid by Paul. So, Paul, right. which we're going to talk about. Which brings us neatly well, on to... to Yes, it's 1978. Uh, to 19... the McCartney, yeah. <laughs> the McCartney yeah. override. And this, right. I did not know about this till I read your book. And I was like, oh, my God, this is a big deal. Holy crap. Um, so when, I think it was January 1st, 1979, is when Paul's deal with Columbia in the United States, yep. um, only here. He was still EMI for the rest of the world. Only, yep. And this was a clause designed to give Paul two and a half percent extra you could go ahead and explain uh, it too well just think think it was two percent extra and it, but that I, was I, for I, EMI though sorry yeah, so, I didn't interrupt now this was EMI though yeah that's right so it as far as I know it, it never applied to his America to the Beatles American record sales right it would be the rest of the world apart from okay. North America yeah so for those uh, of you that yeah. don't know Paul was basically earning more than the other than John's estate uh, George and Ringo at the time for Beatles yeah, right. recordings, yeah. and this was right. uh, this was kept very hush hush until a couple of years later. But we'll get to that. But continue, yeah. Peter. Mm -hmm. um, well, first of all, the question would be, how do I know about it? Mm. And this is a bizarre situation where somebody, and I literally, I mean, I, could, you know, if I, if you put me on the rack, the torture rack, I couldn't tell you who it was. It arrived right. anonymously in the post, mm. addressed to me at Record Collector at some point. In right. the, I don't know, it must have been before the George and George and Ringo and Yoko suing Paul thing mm. came up in the where are we eighty mid eighties, eighty five maybe. Um, somebody sent me a huge amount of information about Beatles royalties, how they're broken up, right. 
and it was just like this spreadsheet. You, you remember old computer spreadsheets? Yeah. That you sort of unfold <laughs> them. Right. Hundreds of pages of stuff that was really difficult to read. Right. And it, it came with no note. It came with no other information. And I started to look through it going, you're, you're telling me there are, you know, I, I don't know, 13 songs on a hard day's night and they're written right. by Lennon and McCartney. I know that. And that's the royalty rate. Yeah. And I didn't then look at it properly uh, because right. it was just too much paper and I couldn't see why anybody had sent it to me. And it was right. only later that I realized after the lawsuit came out, in fact, when I was doing the research for the book, I dug this, I kept it, I dug this thing out and suddenly went, oh, there's the McCartney override on right. page you know, 235. I'd never got that far when I looked at it originally. Yeah. And suddenly right. it's got, yeah, here are the, um, so somebody had obviously right. sent it to me anonymously thinking this is a man who understands but I didn't, and will, mm -hmm. you, you know, sort of, as we say in England, blow the gaff, it, right. um, expose so the story. You, right, so you got it very specific and very detailed. You, you talk yeah. about how for the Please Please Me album, they made 5% uh, with, with, heart, with with the Beatles. Well, it went up. Beatles, yeah, it went up. Like it were, started. Up to 15, yeah. 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 Right. No, no, I'm sorry, 2%. And then you get into really this real specifics is when it comes to the McCartney override, then when you would say that would each would would get 3.5 uh, oh, sorry 3.5 3.45 pence and then McCartney's jumped up to 5.45 uh, yeah. pence and, and the uh, one was and the one please, the big one was the please please me yeah. when um, the other three would get 0.56 pence but but um, Paul's take would then end up being 2.56 uh, pence which is almost you say five times more yeah. than yeah. than that of the other three now and the, the other thing then too would be that the, this Paul is negotiating his solo contract. I think that's important for people to yeah. also understand. This is for him negotiating. This is also for him being loyal to EMI. EMI, yes. Leaving. You yeah. know, this is him also maybe thinking, well, this is you know making up for me having to dish out my own money for Alan Klein that's, as well. That's really important. So yeah. I mean, right, right, exactly. So do you think? Paul is right in these thinkings. Do you think it was right that it was a hush hush? I mean, what what are your thoughts uh, on on this whole the overall um, well, yeah, yeah, well, it, it, the other really important thing to say is Paul was not taking money from the other Beatles because right. the money right. the money was coming out of the 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 share that EMI were going to pay. Um, sorry, okay. sorry, out of their profit. Mm. Um, you know, they were doing very nicely, thank you very much anyway. So <laughs> they could they could afford it, you know. But right. um, so it wasn't a case of each of the Beatles getting less than they would have done. It's just they were getting less than Paul. Um, gotcha. Now, and I can fully understand why five, six year, years later, when perhaps the same long bit of paper reaches George or Yoko or Ringo, and they say... Right. Hang on a minute. What the hell's the McCartney override? Why? And and I can imagine anybody in that situation would feel betrayed because it is as if Paul has gone behind their back, um, right. and he has, but he's not hurting to them. An extent. He's and 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 there is nothing. There, there would have been nothing to prevent George and, and John in seventy nine and Ringo from re-signing with. Um, EMI, right. and they could have done the same deal, maybe even a better deal. Who knows? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good point. Um, but then on the other side of it, then we, we know that he leaves capital for Columbia. Um, now, we also know that I, we probably Columbia knows that he's into publishing, right? So to entice yeah. him over to Columbia, they transfer over um, some publishing rights over to Paul to lure him to Columbia. So again, yeah. um, which now also makes him... Uh, you know, even more wealthy than what he right. is. And, and, but and, but the, we we all know the the publishing. I mean, you make money while you sleep with the, with these publishing rights. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. And of course, the the terrible irony is that a lot more Beatles records were sold in the wake of John's murder. Yep. And so Paul ended up making a lot more money out of the override than um, he could ever have anticipated. I think. In fact, um, up up until John died, I would imagine—I don't know—but because I'm not, I, I can't remember which 
which bit of, of Columbia Publishing um, they transferred to Paul in 79. But I would There's imagine he was... Right, like well, he, he was probably making more money out of that in mm -hmm. royalties than he actually was in Beatles sales in 79 Probably. and 80 because they weren't selling anywhere near as many records then as they had been. Mm -hmm. um, so it just turned out that when John died, suddenly it must have been, um, you know, an enormous yeah. sort of bonus for him. Which is, right. it's it's kind of, it's sad and ironic that, you know, there's, it's becoming profitable yeah. after that. But, yeah. but, uh, but you don't know that's going to happen. I mean, obviously. No, we, of course you know, not. No. He, and, he had and, no idea that was going to happen. No. And, and, and there was nothing illegal in what Paul did. All he did was break um, the sort of un, unwritten agreement that the Beatles would share everything. Mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, he could turn around and say, not only have I just had to fork out $1.25 million or whatever to get rid of Alan Klein, who I never wanted in the first anyway, place. Anyway, you three, right. you three brought Alan Klein in, caused right. all this trouble. Uh, look at my legal bills. You know, that's your fault. It's not mine, but I've had to suffer for it. And, and I had all the sort of bad press as a result. So, And there's a great recording that Tom and I heard not too long ago where Paul's very, have you heard this recording, Peter? It's He's talking with his lawyers. Linda's on the tape. He's speaking very frankly. I don't know how it was recorded. I don't know how it got out, but he's talking about this very subject right around these lawsuits that happened in the 80s. Have you heard that that bit of recording? I think I have, but years after I wrote the book, yeah. So, right. And I, I must admit, I can't remember. I think it was on YouTube or something. It, it was, and it still yeah. is. It was. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah. right. And I think it popped up again recently, and it's really fascinating to hear. I think Paul's in there with... Um, uh, John Eastman, Eastman and Linda, Eastman, right. and and, yeah. and 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 it's about a twenty-minute recording, and you can hear him really talking about the nitty-gritty details of these of the percentages and the tax and all. Yeah, the it's percentages and and helping Ringo with the that promotional, um, you know, the the money he was getting oh, as, as yes, well. That's right. Yeah, you I've know, forgotten so, about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, because he was that was what he was living off for the most part. Mm. So, and you you you, you, you mentioned know. that in the book that at that point in time Ringo you know needed every penny he could get, and was really relying upon it. So Paul's essentially helping Ringo stay afloat. Yeah, I, really, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, mm. Another great moment in the book that I said like a watershed light bulb moment for me reading is this this iconic meeting at the Dorchester Hotel in 1983, when the other three actual well, Yoko and they discover that this override has actually happened. You know, with the override is in place in 79, and then in, in this big meeting that they have at the Dorchester Hotel in December of 83, they find out about it. You know, they find out about <laughs> this. He's getting extra money, which then yeah. leads himself to open up more lawsuits and eventually Paul's non-appearance at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame ceremony, yeah. which is all tied into the same period. Well, is it, it was it that, though, or was it because of the cap? Because when Capitol resigned him, they also gave him more royalties. Um then you know to go back to capital i mean so i was kind of a little bit confused about whether him not showing up to the to the rock and roll hall of fame was it because of this earlier emi um stuff or was it because of the capital uh when they resigned him in what what was it, 85, 85. Or, yeah now i'm trying to remember because when was the rock and roll hall of fame 87 it would have been 80, 88, 88. 88 yeah. right okay so, yeah. so I, I think there must have been another another set of lawsuits yeah. by that time and right. without right. looking at the book I must have I can't remember but um, two events that it did affect very much first of all Live Aid I mean George mm -hmm. was very adamant he didn't want to be at a Beatles reunion mm -hmm. but right. he, he, he very specifically did not want to be at a Beatles reunion with the guy that they were suing at that point because they hadn't settled the um, the issue then. It was very much a live issue. So the idea that George is going to stand on stage and, and perform Let It Be and smile nicely at Paul, it's just not going to happen. And then the, the other thing I'm very sad about, because I was there, the um, the Carl Perkins TV special. Mm. Now, one right. of the perks of my job, I ended up in amazing places sometimes. And mm. one of those was Limehouse uh, TV Studios in South London in whichever month it was, 1985, and the Carl Perkins set, uh, show with George, Ringo, Eric Clapton, Ringo. Roseanne Cash, Dave Edmonds, Dave Edmonds yeah. Um, and then having met Carl later, he said, well, I wanted Paul to be there. And um, when he heard that 
George and Ringo were going to be there, he said, maybe I'll, you know, right. maybe maybe right. I can send you something instead. Because, and officially, I think Paul was on holiday, and he may have been. But I think as much as anything, it was just that. Well, they had their it, moment together. They had their moment together during that tug of war sessions when he writes, you know, yeah, um, yeah. you know, dear, my dear, or old friend or whatever it was. My um, old friend. Yeah. My yeah. old friend. Thank you. Um, yeah. So circling back to something we just talked about. I found it in the book, Peter. Um, here we are. February of 85, Harrison, Starkey and Arnold filed an 8.6 million writ against McCartney <laughs> in New York on the basis that he was earning a, a preferential royalty from Beatles records to the right. others as an incentive for him to re-sign with Capital as a solo Capital, artist, which is go. what Tom right. mentioned. So it was True. because he, he re-signed with Capital. So that was just yeah. another right. lawsuit. Yeah. <laughs> right, okay. Right. 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 Anyways. Fascinating, fascinating let's, stuff. Let's talk about um, a little bit about the music. I mean, when he yeah. re let's go back to 78. He re-signs, or he signs with Columbia. Uh, his, the first thing released then would be uh, Good Night Tonight. Um, talk about hearing that so song for the first time, and maybe a little bit talk, a maybe a little bit about your fandom of Paul. Were you listening to Paul at that yeah. point in time? Um, you know. Not as much as I had been a couple of years earlier. To, to backtrack, right. I almost didn't buy Ram because the reviews in England were so terrible. And then right. when I heard it, I was. It took me two or three plays to go. Actually. It's a bit embarrassing, but I like this record. And now it's just about, I mean, it's my wife's favourite album of all time. It's certainly one oh, of my wow. favourite albums of all time. <laughs> so, um, uh, uh, yeah, and it's, of all the Beatles and Beatles-related records, it's the one I play more than any other. I mm. absolutely, I almost never play Beatles records. Um, they're, they're, they're imprinted on my bald head, you know. Right. And I don't I don't <laughs> need to, to hear them. When I do, I love them, but I don't. Seek them out. Wake up. Yeah, I don't right. wake up in the morning and think, "Ooh, Rubber Soul." I haven't heard that this week. You know, I don't. It's there. <laughs> it's already there until I die. Um, so then, yeah, I bought Wildlife and Red Road Speedway. Um, and my first ever live show was September '75, the Southampton mm. Gaumont, this, or which was okay. the first the, night that was of the, the opening, world tour. Yeah, that was the yeah. opening night yeah. of the world tour. Yep. Yeah. Right. Um, and the two, th well, three things I really remember about that. I mean, I had nothing, never having been to a live gig before, I had no idea. It's about, a, it's a cinema. It's still there. It's a theatre now in Southampton on the south coast of England. Um, it's maybe 3,000, 4,000 seats. Uh, mm. It was about eight, eight rows back. When Paul ah. touched his bass guitar for the first time, um, I and my friend were sort of thrown back about 30 feet. <laughs> And, you know, this was a mix done by a bass player, basically. The bass, mm. I thought my chest was going to cave in every time he touched the bass. Unbelievable. Right. I mean, it worked, but it was, the bass was loud. Outside, mm. there were Americans, because at that time, um, you'll remember Paul couldn't get a, green, uh, his, a visa to come right. in because of drug right. busts. Yep. Same, re yep. same reason John couldn't leave America. Um, and the, there were Americans who'd come over from California, I remember, who were holding signs up saying, desperate, you know, just arrived from Santa Barbara, need a ticket. Mm. And the other thing I can remember so clearly, although I, I don't know if it's on the really bad tape that's out there of the show, uh, because maybe Paul was off mic at the time, but somebody did shout out from near to me pretty early on, what about John Lennon? <laughs> and Paul sort of stepped back and said, "What about John Lennon?" And just went straight into the next song. But I say that may that might not be on the bootleg because it may be he stood off far mic. enough back from the yeah. yeah so mic. have to listen so, to that. Yeah. So that that just shows in '75 still that John mm. versus Paul thing was still a big, you know, yeah. a big deal for fans. And and you see, it's an interesting way to look at there too because by this time Paul is flying high. He has yeah, finally yeah. arrived with that version of Wings and Venus and Mars, and he's like, okay, you know, you all might have had, you know, the success early on, you know, Imagine and All Things Must Pass. Uh, mm. Now I'm I'm here. It's yeah, my time. Right. And yeah. there was, I'm sure, yeah. there was a lot of that coming from Paul at that time. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so you mentioned Venus and Mars. I love that. Listen, listen to what the man said, one of my favorite records. Um, Wings right. and the Speed of Sound, I didn't buy because I was a student, and so I had almost no money. And then I did buy mm. a second-hand copy many years later and wished I hadn't. I think it cost about 20p, and I was done. I was, 
I was robbed. Um, it's a terrible album, um, with the exception of a couple of songs. I love um, Someone's Knocking at the Door, um, whatever that's let, called. Let him yeah, in. Let him in. Let him in. Let him in. Yeah. And, and the other single, Beware My Love, those two. Beware My Love is a great yeah. song. Yeah. yeah. And then um, 70s, when did London Town Seven come March up? of 78. 78. Right. Okay. 78 yeah. Now, I did not buy that record because what else came out in Mar around March of 78? Elvis Costello, Punk. this this year's oh, model. New Wave. What a yeah. fantastic record. 77, we got television. 78, I saw Patti Smith. I saw Costello, The Jam. 79, I saw The Clash. Ah, so you didn't um, run out and buy Mull of Kintyre. Or did you? Oh, well, I hated that. Um, the, rest of, <laughs> the rest of my family like it, but I hate it still, <laughs> to this day. Sorry, Paul, but it is the best-selling you know, record of all time. And yeah. I probably have got a copy somewhere, but I don't, right. know, I don't know why I bought it. Um, and so, yeah, to, to drag you forward to 78, 79, Good Night Tonight was on the radio, but I didn't buy it because it didn't fit mm. in with the kind of stuff I was listening to then. Okay. Um, now you asked us and, to skip across the, the next album because you absolutely hate it, so we're not well, going to well, talk no, about well, it. Well, well, no, the next album, the next album is back to the edge. Well, after that, one. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So, so really, Which... really briefly, I wish I'd seen uh, Wings in '79. I could have done. Oh, you um, didn't. They, I was in London. They were in London. I didn't have much money, um, but I mm. probably could have scrabbled together. But if, if it was a choice that week between going to see Elvis Costello or McCartney. I would no. I thought, well, I've seen McCartney already. I don't need to right, see right. him again. Mm. I didn't hear. I didn't hear "Back to the Egg." There were no real hit singles um, off that record in Britain. Didn't hear it for several right. years afterwards, and it's, it's probably my second favorite McCartney or third, uh, well, maybe. That, that's the thing, you know. People kind of dismiss that record until they go back mm. and listen to it, and yeah. they're like, "Oh my God!" This, I mean, it, and plus, it's nothing like uh, "Good Night Tonight." You know, that, no, that's why I'm, I'm glad that it wasn't on the record because it yeah. would have. Felt like a stuck out like a sore thumb in my opinion. Yeah, it's it's it, it's a, it's a rock record. It's got some beautiful ballads on as well. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I, t I I just think it's lovely. It's the, for me, it's the high point of Wings, uh, which mm. I know may not be oh, anybody wow. else's point of view, but <laughs> I, I love that record. And then yeah, McCartney yeah. too. I bought when that came out because I had a job then, and um, my local record shop. I got to know the guy there, and I bought a lot of records. And so right. the day after I bought it, I played it two times that night. My girlfriend at the time said, you're not going to keep that, are you? And so and I tried to justify. I said, oh, well, this, this song, one of these days, it's crap, she yeah. said. Which is, you know, so I really? said, oh, okay. So right. they were very kind in that shop. They let me take it back, and I swapped it for, I can't mm. remember what. <laughs> but <laughs> some, some, something I thought was better. But I actually played that album this, after, uh, but, this afternoon for the right. first time in maybe the first time since 1980. I don't know. So, um, so you heard it um, again? Do you, do you, yeah. Has your opinion changed, or is um, it still, still still gets trash? I, three or four songs, I think, are okay. The thing I, mm. I played just on Spotify. I played the um, the long, you know, the special deluxe version or whatever. Yeah, and right, there's one right. great track on Archive. there, which is Blue Sway. Yes, Wait, but it, it's, it, it's the orchestral version from '86. Okay. Richard Niles' the, or, uh, orchestration. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. that's beautiful. Um, and actually, Secret Friend um, as well. I surprised myself mm. by liking that. Really? Um, wow. That, that sort of worked for me as a dance kind of thing. You, yeah, but I imagine you would have heard coming up the the single coming yeah, up before yeah. the release, and you know, uh, did you like uh, coming up? It's, did it's it give a catch. You yeah, it's a, it's a catchy song. It was fun to see the video with him in his Beatles yeah. suit and so on. Yeah. Um, and then, where are we? Well, then I'm at Record Collector. And and now you're at Record it. Collector. And now and, and John. So I, yeah, so you were at Record Collector when, when John was. Uh, when John died, yeah. Wow. Um, and, so, and so professionally, I had to keep up. Um, so mm. automatically, I would be the one writing the review of every new McCartney record. And I, mm. I also played Tug of Love. Uh, What's it called? Tug of War. Tug of War. Tug of War. Tug of War. God, <laughs> multi-million selling record. Like a so-called Beatles expert, I can't even remember the name of the album. Tug of something. We all um, have our moment. I, I, I played that also today, and mm. that is half of an absolutely brilliant record. If you, I yeah. think if you took took the best of that, maybe five six songs off that, and three or four off Pipes of Peace, it would be it's up peace. there with his right. best ever work. 
but unfortunately mm. it's the rest of the stuff that I struggle with. But um, mm. I think the influence of George Martin on that record is is huge. Oh, absolutely. And then the, and the well, the first track that they work on, I believe, was uh, we all stand we all together. stand together. Um, which <laughs> it's funny yeah. because it's the first track they work on, but it's the last release, mm. <laughs> you know, of their collaboration. Um, yeah, it doesn't of, come out until January of '84. Right. I think it came out. Yeah, yeah, right. So, um, were you one of the the many many millions and millions of people in attendance to watch "Give My Regards to Broad Street"? Yes, I <laughs> so was. Being my, a little my, sarcastic. Oh. Yep, we, uh, my brother and I went to see it with the week it opened in in Leicester Square in the heart of London. It was the first cinema it was on at. So not the first day, but maybe three or four days in. And my memory is we were just about the only people in the cinema. Um, so it, it was not a hit. And, I, you know, I enjoyed it. But honestly, it's what an embarrassment. Um, yeah. I mean, that is a prime example. If, you, if, you, if you're going to get George Martin back, you, you get George Martin in, A, because he's a brilliant orchestrator, and B, right. because you trust him to be able to say that's not good enough. Now, Paul doesn't take kindly to that, as we all know, because no, he no. says, look, I'm the most successful musician in the history of the universe, which is true. Right. So I'll decide what's good and what's not. Um, but he's not the most successful filmmaker <laughs> in the history of the universe. He wasn't right. even the most successful filmmaker that week. So. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> no. Right. So. I mean, what do you. I, what do you I can't, I can't no. believe there was nobody around him to say. Are you really going to use the old? It was all a dream. <laughs> I mean, what do you my, think? My, oh, sorry, I was just going to say, my, my wife, my wife, many years ago used to teach, um, sort of. Oh, I've no idea what it's called in America, but maybe fourth, fifth, sixth grade, something like that. Kids, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and whenever they wrote stories, she said, if ever they they played that card the it was all a dream she used to say no you can't do it. <laughs> it's the ultimate cop out and yet paul makes a movie based on that i mean it's just what do you uh, make of paul during this period in the early 80s teaming up with michael jackson and stevie wonder i mean is it, yeah, yeah you know did, did, what why did you know did i mean I, how was that really perceived in the uk i mean you were obviously writing at the time uh, you know yeah. was it just like oh but he's just selling out and you know, just... No, no, not at all. No, it was um, certainly with Stevie Wonder. It was seen as a, as a sort of marriage of equals. Number one hit, number one hit yeah, in the UK. Yeah, um, I mean, I find it tough to listen to. I prefer. I always thought I preferred the other song. Um, Rain what's clouds. That you're doing? Oh, you mean? Oh, oh, no, oh yeah. the other the collaboration. Other, the other what's, that? what's that you're doing? Yeah. Yeah, but actually, when I played that earlier, <laughs> that didn't sound anywhere near as good as I, I hoped it would do. But I mean, in retrospect, and I hate to say this, it was Stevie doing Paul a favor because in the mm. 70s, Stevie Wonder was on a different planet to anybody. Right. I mean, his run of albums from, yes. um, yeah. you know, Music, Music in, in My, my Mind, mind yeah. Through Vision, Talking Book, yeah, Talking all book, of those. Yeah. Songs in the Key of Life. Yeah. Yep. Even The Secret Life of Plants, right the way through to yes. Hotter, Hotter Than July, um, uh, which yes. was the record he did just before the, the the tug of war sessions um you know he's un, un, unmatchable by anybody including paul or any other beat um now the michael jackson thing was interesting because that did seem a bit more like oh this young kid's popular so maybe i'll join up with him but they, but weirdly given what i just said i think i saw it as paul giving Michael a leg up into a different world that he was a teen yeah, star possibly and um, because he's saying, an up and oh, coming. You know, yeah. 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 He's yeah. up and coming. And plus it's, it plus it's Michael that reaches out to Paul, um, yeah. you know, which I, I don't know if people realize that. Right. Um, you know, Christmas then, day, no less. Right. Right. <laughs> and then this is, this is also the, the closest he ever got to having two number ones on, on one album, yeah. which in the, yeah. in the, the UK pipes of peace, uh, pipes of peace is a number one, number one hit and then say 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 goes to number two uh in the uk yeah um yeah. so this is the, also the time where he's hassle having more success in the charts in the uk than he is yeah. in in the us Ab absolutely um I, I find it tough to listen to say 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 anymore mm. i hate hate the girl is mine which is is that on thriller i think it is thriller yeah uh, yeah it must be the worst track on thriller by a long long way <laughs> The, and it was the, the first single. It yeah, was the, the first single. Right. The spoken word bit when they're fighting over the girl. Oh, oh. goodness. 
Oh, embarrassing. Come on, Mike. But the, the track I like that nobody else seems to like is The Man. The Man. I thought that oh, was man. a great track. That should have been the single. But it so. it, it kind of almost was. Almost it was, kind of so almost was. was. And do you you guys probably know what everybody says the B-side was going to be of that? Uh, the um, uh, Blackpool. Of, yeah. Blackpool. No, Blackpool. not true. Yeah. Not true. A hundred percent, I can guarantee you that is not true. Yeah. What was it going to be? Okay. Uh, I no idea. But oh, I do yeah. know it was right. not going to be Blackpool. Blackpool. Um, okay. And I'm not going to tell you how I know that, but I know. Okay, 100%. that's fair. But I have a okay. there's a I have a Spanish uh, 45 promo of the man, um, but um, for, it's 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 the man on both sides. Right. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. That's yeah, a great it's a great song. Play it twice. That's a good track, and it's a good segue into you know um, the next period that kind of gets a little sketchy is when Michael Jackson, of course, buys the catalog. Yeah. And Paul, right. tell us a little bit about Paul's attempt to go to Yoko for twenty million or whatever to get it back, but you know, chose not to. I'm, I'm tempted to say the story. <laughs> the story's in the book, and it. I'm sure it's told better there than I'll be able to. Yeah. But did, did Yoko? I think not. Um, I think she was saying, "Look, we don't need to pay that much money." And Paul mm. said, they, they want right. 20 million and we can get it. No, no, offer them five. Five. Um, right, or five. Whatever it was, something yeah. like that. And Paul could not twist Yoko's arm to to, to come up for the, to the full amount. And they lost the rights as a result. Which I, so, right. Paul, could have, Paul could have bought those songs. Well, no you, problem. You himself. Think, well, and, unless he'd spent all the money on Broad Street, I suppose. Yeah, that's possible. Well, he, Although, I, I think, not, and plus not, if he... Not on, I'll tell you what, he didn't spend the money on a script writer. Anyway, sorry. No, he did not. Right. <laughs> no. If he buys if he buys these on his own, listen, yeah. I mean, this puts him in a this I mean, he is not only the richest person on the planet, he's probably the richest person in the universe. Uh, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. if if he you know, I mean this is an endless stream of cash. Yeah. Right here. I mean, this this kept that kept Michael Jackson afloat during his during his trouble years. Absolutely. You know, all his legal what, what... legal battles. Yeah, of course. What we don't know is how much available cash Paul had at that point. Right at the point. Um, it, right. You know, because everything's tied up, and he's got three hundred different right. companies. He's yeah. Not touring. Right. Okay. He's yeah. not having he's having hit records, but it may be that he hadn't got twenty million dollars suddenly to be able to go, you know, snap and mm. and, right. and get them. But um, again, yeah, you know, the eighties. You're right about the go ahead, Tom. the Yoko thing. Sorry, I'm just you know. You write about the Yoko thing. Yoko's like, you know, I I know people. Maybe we can get a better deal. Let's mm. let's shoot for, for for five million. But yeah, it's you know even five million. It's just, I just don't see that you know being the case. But go ahead, Andy. No, no. So that you know obviously goes through that live aid debacle. Um, press to play. Uh, the, you know, up and down record. Did you did you buy that too or no? Um, well, at this point, I was getting sent free ones. Ah, you were. Ah. So, and, and, and I was on the EMI mailing list by now, so I got copies of the singles, and I didn't get all 35 different versions of press, uh, <laughs> but I got quite a few of them. And for my sins, I was like that single. I mean, origi the original version of it. Uh, I think it's great. It's a catch catchy yeah. little tune. And then, of course, you know, UK only, Once Upon a Long Ago, and Back on My Feet. Yeah. Did you did you yeah. enjoy those songs, too? Uh, yes, I did. Um which that that tied in with all the best. Is that that was right? stuff. Yes. Yeah. yeah. All the best. Yeah. yeah. That oh, part of that stuff. Yeah. 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 Well, that part of that all the best campaign and all mm. that, which kind of yeah. was the when Paul got Richard Ogden in there to kind of give him a little bit of a boost, right. get mm. the all get, so get you, all the, you know, yeah. get that out there and then get a find a new collaborator, right. which is what he told him to do yeah. with Costello. Yeah, and you being a Costello fan, I mean, talk about were you a fan of the the songs that they worked on together obviously you know spike you know he, he's got uh, uh veronica right that paul helps out with mm. a little bit you got back on my feet um what's the one on flowers in the dirt that i'm uh 20 fine fingers uh, no no um, the one, the, the, you, the, the duet. you you want oh. you want her too you want her you want her too yeah yeah which, right. which I, I think right. was the perfect version of Paul and Elvis trying to be like Paul and John. Yeah, John. With you okay. know, like, yeah. oh, I'll say something positive and you'll say something negative. Yeah. Like, oh, right. God, if we're not careful, Paul's going to suddenly pop up and tell us the story about it's it's getting better <laughs> for the nine hundred fifty <laughs> millionth time. <laughs> we all know that story, Paul. Right. Don't say it ever right. again, please. Say it again. <laughs> Right. Oh um, my. The flowers in the dirt, but uh, you know, a UK number yeah. one, good, good record. 
No. Yes, I, I think so. I mean, drags a bit towards the end of the second side, maybe. Um, mm -hmm. Was it Flowers of a Dirt that he started doing the dance stuff? Uwe Le Soleil, yep. is that from that? Period? Yeah. yeah. Party, then, party, party. Yeah, and at some point, I, again, I can't quite remember how I ended up with all the 12-inch promos of weird dance things mm. that probably yeah. sound, actually sound better now than they... You know, I didn't really appreciate that stuff at the time. But uh, but this is yeah. a nice segue to kind of cl close out the 80s with his music because now this the uh, the groundwork is set. Um, the lawsuits start to come to an end, which then mm. paves the way for the BBC release and ultimately the anthology. Um, mm. You know, obviously the 80s, all these things were going on. Finally, they were resolved. And you've got, uh, you know, kind of that second wave that kind of happened there with, with the BBC album. And then obviously George kind of going into financial straits, you know, with, and mm -hmm. losing everything, you know, would the anthology have happened? Probably not, but it kind of seems that from that point on that there is some kind of peace there with the, through, with the camps. Would you agree from that point yeah, on, from, uh, from the uh, mid nineties on? Yes. Except when George was doing interviews because he could be sarcastic mm. Casting, and, he, yes. and he usually was when it came to talking about right. Paul and he would say something like, Oh, the, the interview would, interviewer would invariably say, oh, Paul says that there might be a chance you, yeah. you two will work together. Yeah. And George right. would say, oh, has Paul got a new album out then? I'm coming. <laughs> yeah, so. Yes. Um, right. Yeah, yeah, but There's it, another great one. There's another great one where there, I think it's just probably during the Broad Street era where the interviewer is talking to oh. George about, um, you know, um, Paul doing, you know, remaking all those Beatle classics. And then George says something like, well, he's, he's probably got no more good ones of his yeah. own. <laughs> oh, uh, good stuff. Good great stuff, stuff great stuff. So, yeah, that's the, that's, that's the, you know, that's our yeah. kind of a dive into looking into the 80s Mac aspect of it. Um, Peter, great job on the book. Yeah. Um, well, well, thank you. Uh, what I was just going to say before we rush yeah. off was, yeah, yeah. Uh, I've, I've not, I haven't seen, other podcasts i will go back and watch some but maybe i've been oh, more critical you. of paul than many most of your guests and i in which case i apologize yeah. to your viewers no, no, and you're listeners you're not the only one you are not no. the only one my friend there's all levels of fandom yeah, and all but, levels of criticism too so don't worry. rest rest assured first of all he and john george and ringo changed my life and he's right. made just about my favorite listening album of all time ram and yeah. uh, you know so many brilliant songs. Um, right. Still to this day, melodies just ooze out of him. Exactly. Um, I I don't necessarily like everything he does these days. I've got views about whether he sh should still be touring or not. Um, yeah. But you know, fundamentally, what an incredible musician! What an incredible composer! Um, and haven't we all been lucky to be alive at the same time he has been? Absolutely. We, we've said that, we've, we have said that on this show many times. But are, are you Peter, working on Peter, yeah, what are you new? working on now? You got anything coming up? Um, well, besides to... obviously publicizing my book yeah. Growing Up, mm -hmm. Sex in the Sixties, which is a look at the darker side of the sixties sexual culture. Um, I've just finished my first novel, which has nothing to do with the Beatles. And I have no idea because I have no sort of um, reputation in that area. It may well never get published, so you may hear about it here and never again. Mm. But we'll see. Anyway, it's been <laughs> fun. Sex, I really enjoyed you, it. This, the sex in the in the sixties. Now you said that was only available in the UK in the in the yep. in Australia, right? But you can probably get it. You can probably get it. You know. Oh yeah, I'm, I, I would know, imagine. You're interested. Amazon. Yeah, an yeah. ebook? Could yeah. you get an ebook, a Kindle yeah. version um, of it? Yeah, uh, there certainly is in England. There's a there's an audio book as well. So great. All right. Talk well, about uh, that for a few minutes. Well, let, let's oh. let's have him talk about the, that book for a few minutes, if you want. To. Okay. Well, um, I've written lots about the sixties, and uh, I've written lots about the sort of politics and music of the sixties. And I kept coming across, obviously, the sexual revolution that we all know about. The, in Britain, anyway, there was the what, what order did, did they come? The, there was a big trial in nineteen sixty about D. H. Lawrence's book. Lady Chatterley's mm. Lover, which was finally allowed to be published in paperback. So that sort of um, was a breakthrough as far as censorship was concerned. Um, there was a legalization of homosexuality up to a certain point in the late 60s. The same with abortion, there's the pill. Um, there are various sort of quite famous scandals in the 60s as well. Profumo um, affair. Yeah, the Profumo affair, particularly 63, yeah. Um, 
No, I, but I deliberately wrote, decided to not write about those, and I picked other ways of looking at the 60s. And um, very briefly, one of the themes of my book, sadly, is that um, alongside that sexual revolution and the sort of hippie underground sexual revolution as, as well of, of everything being allowed, mm. um, there was also, weirdly, a culture came up in the late 50s, early 60s, and was reborn in the late 60s, which made it okay, it seemed, for young girls to be preyed upon by older men. And this mm. wasn't was wasn't the responsibility of the, the hippies or you know mm. the, the generation who were born after the war. It was actually culture being controlled by people who were born well before the Second World War. Um, and the 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 key um, bit of evidence for me is is the book L L Lolita. Sorry, struggling to pronounce yeah, it. Um, so the first two chapters of the book are about the book coming out what that does to the culture. And, uh, and then the second chapter is about the film. And just really briefly, because it's a dark subject, mm. I'll say that I was amazed, horrified to read British National newspapers, 1959 through to 62 particularly. And there would be stories about old men having sex with underage girls, and it would be the girls who got punished. It was always their fault. Mm. Dark, so right? that's that. That's one of the dark themes. Then yeah, I'll under, understand if you want to cut that out. <clears throat> no, no, no. We'll, we'll, we'll no, no. It's all. It's, no, kind no. Of, it's all part no. of the the sixties yeah. culture. It, 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 it ties it into it, and we'll we'll have a link for um, that yeah. book as well. Oh, in the, great. In the, okay. We'll have put a link for that in the video below. So if you're you know interested in but that, the, go. But uh, but there is also a Beatles connection. There is a chapter about pop and sex because mm. basically pop pop is about sex and dancing right. and, and dancing is about mm. sex um, but the particular focus of that chapter is john and yoko doing the two virgins album mm -hmm. john's infamous self-portrait film right um his um the drawings he did of the honeymoon what's it called bag mm. one the bag one ba yeah drawings yeah. and and also yoko's film films of nude bottoms right. and stuff. bottoms yeah. so i use that as a way to look at the 60s um yeah in, in, in right. the pop uh, the, the, there are like much more light-hearted <laughs> aspects of the book as well i tried to cover the whole sort of gamut but do it in ways that people weren't expecting so great no we will include that, cool. include that too so um Peter Doggart, thank you so much for giving yeah, us some time you. today and, and a dive back mm. into uh, the book that you published in 2009 called You Never Give Me Your Money. Yeah. Um, and uh, really, if you have not got it, please get it. We'll have a link below to get this. It is really one of the most essential books that you will read, Beatles-related literature ever. It's not about yes. you know how many times they sang Hey Jude. It's really it's personal, <laughs> but it has chock full of details about all the lawsuits and how they connect personally to the four Beatles post-1970, and it's written wonderfully. And uh, Peter, thank you so much. For, for, thank, for you. It. thank you. Yes. I've enjoyed oh, yeah. it. Very kind. So thank for you. Tom, for Peter, this is Andy yeah. signing off for episode 219, and we'll see you next time. Peace and love. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Tom Hanyadi and Andy Nichols, with musical contributions by Dylan.